Good morning. Welcome to Ramsey Baptist Church and our Sunday morning service. This morning we have Gavin preaching for us. Gavin has recently completed his PhD in Old Testament and he's going to be preaching on faith from Daniel chapter 3. Now though as always we're going to begin our time together with a verse of scripture. But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those who love your name be joyful in you. Let's just pray together. Our Father, this morning we do put our trust in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask, Lord God, that you would help us to shout for joy this morning, that you would help us to rejoice in our Saviour and in our salvation. Lord, may we know that you are the one who is defending us, even today. Amen. Well, our opening hymn this morning is Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God, which is a great hymn to help you remember at least three verses of Scripture. Let's just sing together. some notices and there's just three things that I want to bring to your attention briefly this morning. First of all the big news is next Sunday evening we will be opening up Salem Chapel for the first public gathering of our church that we've had since March. More information about that uh, is coming out to you but if I can just highlight a few things for you now. If at all possible please do uh, let us know in advance if you're wishing to attend. We especially need to know how many people will be in your bubble. Uh, Andy Beale is putting together a form which you can use to uh, book a place online. That form will be accessible either through the Facebook group or through our WhatsApp group. But also you can, uh, if that system is uh, something you don't have access to, you can. Uh, just let us know either by email or telephone. I'd also just like to say in line with the government's changing regulations, you will have to wear a face mask 
and maintain social distancing rules unless for some reason you're exempt from that wearing of those masks. And please also do bear with the stewards if you do come along on that uh, Sunday evening as they'll be as new to it as you are and we'll work things out to some degree as we go along. Above all though, as we gather together next Sunday evening, let's choose to thank God that we can be together again in the same building, rather than perhaps find things to complain about or to criticise. Secondly, I just want to mention there'll be no Bible studies for the next two weeks as I'm on annual leave. Uh, the prayer cells are going to continue though, and your group leaders will be in touch with you about the timing for those cells. And then finally, in regards to the notices, don't forget our activity mornings. The next one is this Thursday uh, at 10 o'clock. Please do tune into that, watch it, like it, support it, and pray that God would use it to his honour and his glory. Now we're going to read together from God's word, and our reading is taken from the book of Daniel and chapter 3. So Daniel chapter 3. We're going to read the whole chapter together. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counsellors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counsellors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre, in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. And Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury, and the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
he spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valour who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans and their other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he arose in haste and spoke, saying to his counsellors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire, and the satraps, our ministers, governors, and the king's counsellors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose body the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other god who can deliver like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Well, may God bless his word as we've read it together this morning. Now we're going to come to prayer. Let's just pray together. Our Father in heaven, you are the great God. You are the Lord of heaven and of earth the Lord of our lives, which you hold in your hand, like you held the lives of these three servants that we've just read about in your hand. And we want to thank you so much this morning for every blessing that you pour out upon us. We thank you for the sun that shines, for the rain that falls. We thank you for the food that we have, the clothes we wear, our homes, our families, our friends, our jobs, our health. How good you are to us. We especially thank you this morning for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his finished work on the cross of Calvary. We thank you for his resurrection that proves his victory. We thank you for his blood that washes us clean of all our sin. We thank you for your spirit who is at work within us today. We thank you for our church. We thank you for every member. We thank you for the deacons. We thank you for the elders. And we pray that as we open up next Sunday evening, Lord, be pleased to bless that time and be pleased, Lord, to use it to your honour and your glory. Help us to be encouraged through the gathering of your people together. And help us, Lord, to honour our government, even as we seek to honour you in that gathering. And Lord, we thank you so much that now we are able to do that. Father, we ask too this morning for the forgiveness of our sin. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us to hate the sin that indwells. Pray, Lord, for your help in resisting temptation and in living in paths of righteousness. Lord, bless your word to us that we've just read. And as Gavin opens it up to us, speak to us through it, we pray. We thank you, Lord God, for the message that he has prepared for us to hear. And Father, this morning we want to remember our persecuted brethren. We think of those who are perhaps even today facing similar challenges uh, to your people in Babylon, those whose lives are at risk because of their faithfulness to you, those who are willing to die rather than 
bow the knee in Muslim lands or communist lands to those false gospels and those false regimes. Lord, we confess that perhaps we do struggle to understand just what it's like living with that danger every single day and just what those trials entail. But you know, Lord God, what all your people are going through. So we do place those men, women and children into your hands. And we pray, Lord God, that you would keep them, that you would protect them, and that, Lord God, you would bless their witness so mightily that many of their persecutors may come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. And, Father, we remember our own land, remember our own town, and we pray, Lord God, that through our witness you would bring the light of your gospel to bear in this community. We pray, Lord God, for our activity morning this Thursday, that you would use it to honour and glorify your name, that your gospel will go forth into many homes around us uh, on Thursday. Lord, make us lights that shine out from this lampstand in Ramsey to your honour and to your glory. Amen. Now we have a song for the children, after which uh, Gavin will be bringing God's word to us. Hello again. Today's song is about a man who prayed very hard. He prayed three times a day and he was going to be punished for his behaviour, but God protected him. Good morning. You don't have to look very far to find troubles in our world, do you? The storms and furnaces of life exist all around us. And so often we want peace and calm in our lives, but life happens. And it's anything but peace and calm, the peace and calm that we're looking for. Life can be going along smoothly for a season. Your job is satisfying. Your friends and family are enjoyable. Your goals, finances, health, and outlook seem bright. Then all of a sudden, life throws a curveball. Someone you know gets sick, you lose your job, a friend or family member betrays you. The things you felt secure in all of a sudden feel shaky and uncertain. At the present time, especially, people all around us are concerned about things happening in the world. Am I going to be safe, they ask. Is the world going into economic meltdown? Tough times force us to ask some deep questions. And whether you believe in God or not, you've got to at least admit that you don't have all the answers, that, that the present situation is bigger than ourselves. And in such times, Christians have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to help them, to strengthen them 
and to get them through the challenges of life. Perhaps you think that faith is just a crutch, something to feebly cling on to when you feel desperate. Not at all. Faith reminds us that God is in control and that we need to rely on him to see us through, even when the path ahead is dark and unsteady. He is steady and he is ready. He is willing and able to sustain us through anything. God's unchanging character can give us a firm foundation when things feel unsteady and uncertain. Times are tough and we need God, especially at this time. And whether you've had a bad medical report or a relationship that has fallen apart, faith reminds us that God is still trustworthy and he is still good. You know, it's easy to say that we trust God, but what about trusting God in hard times? What happens when life doesn't go the way we would like or the way we expected? It's easy to trust God in the good seasons of life, but is that really trust? Or how about trusting in him when things could go well, but you'd need to abandon faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, or you'd need to abandon faith in the Bible, or you'd need to stop going to church? What do I mean? Well, let me explain what I mean by using an incident that is mentioned in the Bible. The ancient Israelites, who lived 600 years before Jesus was born, faced difficult and trying times. But few face challenges such as the young men in the passage that we're looking at today, Daniel chapter 3. And this morning, I want us to think about the challenges of faith that these three young men faced during tough times and times that they were tempted to perhaps abandon their faith. Hopefully, this will help us and encourage us in our own faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And my first point that I have for you this morning is the environment of faith. Faith is called for during unusual times. Your faith is tested when things aren't normal, when things aren't going as planned when things are happening around you that you cannot control, that you weren't expecting. We might be tempted to complain at this time, this time of COVID-19, that it's a real test to our faith. But testing during difficult times is actually a good thing. I have a saying that you only know the true sailor in a storm, which means this, that you don't know the true sailor unless he's put in a circumstance that he finds difficult. A storm, that's when you know how good he is and how true a sailor he is. Well, in the same way, of course, our faith is essential at all times, but it's really important to exercise that faith and rely on that faith during difficult and challenging times, times where, that we cannot control. And Daniel and his friends were facing very unusual circumstances. At the beginning of the 6th century BC, that 600 years before Jesus was born, a new superpower had emerged in the world, the Babylonian Empire. It defeated the huge Assyrian Empire. Now, imagine the USA today which has dominated world politics for a hundred years or so. Imagine that the US has been wiped out in an instant. That's exactly what happened during Daniel's time and his three friends. Now it's true that Daniel and his friends were made to leave home at gunpoint or probably spear point, and that they were along with their friends, colleagues and relatives forced to move from their home that they were familiar with to a strange country. And so often when we think about challenging times, we think about those times of persecution, killing and dying. And certainly it's true that these friends here, along with Daniel, they face some difficult times just like that, where their friends were being killed and others were being forcibly moved to somewhere else. 
that's only one kind of challenging situation. And you might be tempted to think that when these Jews, when they were living in Babylon, they were living in prisons, their life was squalor and misery, and that they were being victimized and persecuted all the time. Uh, well, actually, that's not true at all. And how do we know this? The Bible gives us enough information about how the people of Judah are taken into exile. But once they start living in Babylon, we have very little information about their lifestyle apart from that of Daniel and his friends. Most of the Jews actually lived comfortable lives and became servants of the empire in exchange for land. Not too long ago, about 200 clay tablets came to light. Most of these contain official business and land documents about the Jews living in a place called, would you believe it, Judah Town. You've heard of Chinatown? Well, this was Judah Town. They were able to carry on their old ways of life, but they served the empire. For those closest to the Babylonian government, however, the temptations were always present to compromise. The events of Daniel chapter 3 take place sometime after the Jews have settled in Babylon. And by this time, these three young men have seen their colleagues already abandoning their faith. They have left their Jewish scriptures, their God, the true and living God, and they have settled into a more comfortable lifestyle, have taken on the Babylonian ways in which God has been forgotten. And the stand that these three young men will take to be true to their faith, there is a lesson for us here today as well. In our 21st century Western world, Christians aren't killed and tortured. Some countries, of course, in some countries, Christians are killed. But here we have a comfortable way of life. But we do face pressures to conform to the world's ways. It's very easy to be assimilated in the world's way of life if we just give up our faith and give up the scriptures, forget our God, forget Jesus especially if rewards are offered and life seems easier without Christianity than with it. We Christians do face internal struggles to remain true to our convictions and commitments. It would be far easier to go with the crowd, but that's not what we are called to do. We live in an environment in which when we exercise our faith, we must face the pressures of compromise and stand true to our faith. There was a famous TV series called The Prisoner in the 1960s. It was about a man taken against his will. He was forcibly transferred to a secret location. He finds himself in a pleasant community, a place called The Village. As long as its occupants get about with their daily business and don't step out of line, they do just fine. Each one of them has lost his or her name and is instead given a number, an entirely new identity. But our hero, number six, as he is now called, is especially rebellious, and he's difficult to break because he is so principled. In the same way, the Babylonians tried their very best to change the identities of Daniel and his three friends. They were given new names even. Azariah, for example, Yahweh has helped, that's what it means. He now becomes Abednego, which means slave of the god Nabu. These Babylonians try very hard, but it doesn't work. In this environment, these three friends stand firm to their faith. Faith is called for during some challenging situations, but faith may be tested by the personality of a difficult leader also. Now, this particular lesson won't apply to all of us, but for those of us who have jobs and who have difficult bosses, then here's a lesson for us. Nebuchadnezzar is a driven man. He's ruthless, ambitious. He has recreated Babylon, making it into the largest city of the world. Who hasn't heard of the Ishtar Gate? 
or the Hanging Gardens. Nebuchadnezzar at this time is the most powerful person in the entire world. He's arrogant, proud. He's an unpredictable character, a person who believes that he's at the center of the entire universe. Does that remind you of any of our politicians today? No, I wasn't thinking of him, but I was thinking of this guy. Nebuchadnezzar, he's not your stereotypical bad guy at all. He is actually a very intelligent ruler. After Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ, Nebuchadnezzar falls to his feet saying, truly your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. That's found in the previous chapter, Daniel chapter two. But because there is no depth of understanding or repentance, Nebuchadnezzar's belief disappears. And by the events of chapter three, when he condemns Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego to death for worshiping the God of gods, he has already forgotten what he has said before. You know, it's important to pray for our leaders. God commands the Jews before they go to Babylon. He says these words in Jeremiah 29 verse seven, seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace, you will have peace. Although not all of us will have to deal with the personalities of our leaders, we will all feel the effects of the policies and decisions that our state leaders make. The decisions that our leaders make will affect our health, our economic situation, our church life, our freedom of worship. Nebuchadnezzar, being the king of a mighty empire, he has a lot of decisions to make. And one decision that he does make is found here in this chapter. He knows that he's the most powerful person in the entire world, and he wants to make sure that everyone knows about it. And so he builds this tall statue, whether it's of himself or of a God is not made clear, but it says here in verse one that he builds the statue 60 cubits high and six cubits wide. Now that's about 90 feet tall and nine foot wide. There are two basic ways to make a statue impressive. The first way is to place the statue high up. Here's an example from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Of course, making statues that portray the Lord are forbidden in the scriptures. But I'm sure we could all agree that this statue looks very impressive. Another way to make a statue impressive is to place it on flat ground, a level plain, just like Nebuchadnezzar has done here. And Nebuchadnezzar builds this very tall statue and causes all the people to fall down and worship it. And caught up in this policy of his are also these three friends. Now they just happen to be governors. That's what the scriptures tell us. They have been made governors from the previous chapter. And so they're very prominent when they take a stand against the policy that Nebuchadnezzar issues. Now we finished this first point about the environment of faith, and I'm going to move on to my next point. It's the exercise and effects of faith. Incidentally, this is slightly different to the handout if you have one. Because I don't want this video to go on too long, I've combined my second and third points. Faith must be exercised in relation to the true God. There are many kinds of gods in this world. They are all jostling for superiority and attention over the one true living God of the Bible. There are gods of wood and gods of stone gods of entertainment and gods of pleasure, gods of business, sport, industry. Our one true God asks us to put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, his son. Faith must be acted on. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is much more than a feeling. 
It's a choice. It's a choice to believe what he says is right, even though your feelings or your circumstances around you would have you believe something different. Of course, God does care about your feelings and your circumstances. But living a life of belief and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ means that you have to follow him and obey him, even though it may be difficult and you can't see the way ahead. Now imagine the scene in Babylon. The music plays and everyone around King Nebuchadnezzar bows down and worships this idol. It's very difficult for those three friends, I'm sure. They are governors whom Nebuchadnezzar appointed. So he is their boss. And yet they have a higher governor, a higher king, whom they have to respect and obey before Nebuchadnezzar. And that is the living God. Their actions remind me of a famous photograph that was taken at the launch of a German ship in 1936. Because the ceremony was attended by Adolf Hitler, almost everyone is shown holding up their arms in the Nazi salute. They're pledging allegiance to Hitler and to the Nazi party. All are saluting, except a single man who folds his arms defiantly. Here is a close-up of this man. I did some digging and I found that most of the websites today have wrongly identified him. This brave person is most likely Gustav Wegert. According to his son, who is an evangelical pastor himself, Gustav always stood by the motto, you should obey God more than men. Gustav was a devoted Christian and he felt that a believer should be in church, not at a political rally on a Sunday. What one man did one day in 1936 has had a powerful effect upon many today. Even today, we do face all sorts of similar, though less dramatic situations in our daily lives. They challenge our trust and submission to God. How you respond to these situations are the indicators of your faith. What would you do if you were under peer pressure and your friends wanted you to go to the pub and get drunk? Would you go along with them or would you resist? What would you do if you were at work and your boss wanted, to, uh, wanted you to lie and put something false in a report? Would you agree? Or would you object? All these situations have happened to Christians, and there are thousands more like them. You will be put to the test of whether you will obey God first or yield to pressure from the world. But let's come back to the book of Daniel. Two things puzzle me. Did Nebuchadnezzar not see the three young men standing up? Why did it take the objectors, the people who are jealous of them, to go and complain to Nebuchadnezzar about them, for Nebuchadnezzar to respond. Surely he must have known what these three young men believed in, because he appointed them, and he had already been acquainted with Daniel. So he must know. But I think it's because he's been backed into a corner. These men, they come and they object. They, they say, those three young men there, the governors, didn't you appoint them as governors? And didn't you say that if anybody doesn't bow down to the, to the statue, then they will be thrown into a fiery furnace? I think he's been backed into a corner and he needs to respond. So what does it say here? He's very angry and he calls for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And how do these three young men respond? Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. But notice they don't just stop there. They carry on and say, but if he does not, 
We do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. You would expect these men of faith to say something on the lines of the following. We believe that God will rescue us, and we don't think he will do anything otherwise. They actually acknowledge that God may not rescue them. Today's so-called faith preachers and faith healers, they know nothing about faith. They claim that even if you have any thoughts that God may not rescue you, then you don't have faith. Well, these three faithful young men, they acknowledge that God may not rescue them. And it's not about doubt at all, because they have no specific promise from God that they will be rescued at this time. And the answer that these men of faith give is the model for all of us who follow the true God and how we should respond when we face a difficult challenge and when scripture has no specific thing to say about our particular situation. Esther said the same thing. Queen Esther, when she was put in a position to plead for her people, she knew she could go to the king she asked her uncle to pray for her because she had faith in God. But she also said those words, if I perish, I perish. These men and women of faith in the Bible, well, they have a secret. And it's this, that God will be with them whether he rescues them from their ordeal or not. Indeed, these men and women of faith, they knew that sometimes God has a purpose for allowing us to go into the fire. He doesn't always deliver us from the fire. The Apostle Paul was ready for the challenges of life as well as dying. He wasn't scared because he knew God would never abandon him. And so these young men here in the scriptures in Daniel chapter 3, they are ready for anything because they know God would never abandon them, even if they died. But this answer enrages Nebuchadnezzar. He is so angry, he commands his most trusted warriors, mighty men of valor, says the scriptures. Whenever that phrase is used, you know it's the best trained men that he has. And what do these men do? They cast them into the burning fiery furnace. He even commands the furnace to be heated up seven times hotter. And in fact, ironically, the fire is so hot, it kills his best warriors even. God doesn't need to deliver the three young men from the fiery furnace, but he does. And Nebuchadnezzar is absolutely astonished. He rises in haste and asks, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Look, he exclaims, I see four walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. That phrase, the Son of God, in the New King James Version, is not correct, unfortunately. The original Aramaic reads, the fourth is like a son of the gods, a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar was a polytheist, and he believed in many gods. In any case, God sends someone, perhaps an angel, to be with these three young men and strengthen them in the fire. Nebuchadnezzar is so gobsmacked, he calls out the three young men, they come out, and everyone is astonished that there seems to be no effects from the fire upon the young men. Their hair is fine, their clothes are fine, they're absolutely fine. But I must move on to my final and last point, and it's this, that when you take a stand for your faith, it will affect those around you. Faith perpetuates faith. When you take a stand for the faith and remain strong, 
Others who are weak in the faith are also strengthened by your own act. Your act of faith has a tremendous impact upon others. It may be that your resisting getting drunk will strengthen an alcoholic. Your refusal to lie in the office report will shake up your boss for his own good. Because three young men stood for their faith, the entire Jewish race in Babylon could have been strengthened. We certainly know that many came back to their own country and were still firm in the faith. But faith also impresses unbelievers. Nebuchadnezzar must acknowledge that the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego is like no other God. But he is not just moved by the power of their God. He is also moved by their willingness to lay down their own lives for their God, rather than disobey him and instead follow Nebuchadnezzar's own word. Have a look at verse 28. It says here, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own god. He is so impressed by them. So you see, he's an intelligent king. He is not so bitter that he cannot see the truth. And in fact, I believe that this is one step in his own conversion. Interpreters will usually ask whether Nebuchadnezzar converted to Judaism. A more skeptical commentator may be doubtful, but I think that there's every reason to believe that he might have indeed converted before he died. Your stand for the faith and your belief and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ can have a tremendous positive impact upon the others around you. Even unbelievers, think of Nebuchadnezzar who went through that long process of perhaps realizing that there is no God like this God, of realizing that he needs to be humbled and he finally accepts the sovereignty of God. That is what faith does. It acknowledges the sovereignty of God in trials and also has an impact upon others around you. Well, this has been an interesting topic, but I trust that you will be firm and resolute in your commitment to Jesus Christ. Well, thank you for that, Gavin. Our closing hymn is How Firm a Foundation.
Well, thank you so much for joining with us this Sunday. Uh, we look forward to meeting again next week. Next week, Peter Stewart will be leading our service and Richard Brown will be preaching for us. Now, let's just pray together. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.